morning. This morning, all over the world, in churches, great and small, in all the world's languages, Christians gather together and they begin their service by saying, He is risen. And the people respond by saying, He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Well, amen. Paul writes this to the Corinth church. He says, For I passed on to you as most important what I received. And here it is. Most important, he says. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day according to to the scriptures. This morning we are here to proclaim a Savior who is no longer in his tomb. He is risen. He remains risen. And one day we'll be raised like him. Let's all stand out together. As we begin our service this morning by singing, Christ the Lord is risen today. Or if you've never done this before, 
Would you please take a connection card that you'll find on the back of the pew in front of you and fill it out for us, if you're willing to, just as completely as it applies to you. When the offering plate comes your way, feel free to place that card in the plate. It'll make its way back to me and to others, and we'll be so glad to express our appreciation for your visit. Now we've come to the time for prayer, and so please join me as we pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We give you praise, O oh God. Hallelujah, because the Savior has risen and He lives. And we're able to know Him as Christ in us, our hope of glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We praise you, God, because you've made us one church with one mission. And because you are making us one church with one mission in obedience to the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 God, we praise you because you've provided for us and you've guided us to give through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering so that we have reached and surpassed our goal, having given over $7,000 now. And we thank you for this, Lord, and we say hallelujah. 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 And we also, Lord, bow the knees of our hearts in humility and in confession, acknowledging that we have not, as consistently as we should have, lived in light, in the light of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have not lived at times as we should have in hope and in confidence. We've not lived at times as we should have in encouragement in Christ. And God forgive us at times we have not lived as if Christ is truly Lord as he is. We ask, O oh God, for forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you, Lord, for your long suffering, patience, and mercy toward us. We thank you, O oh God, for the transforming power that is at work in us. We thank you, God, for the confidence that we have that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. And we ask God for your help this morning in accord with our need. We ask for the encouragement in Christ that is right for believers in Jesus to have. And we also ask, O oh God, that our eyes would be open today. What would we have for you to do for us, O oh God, that our eyes would be opened. We ask that our eyes would be opened to see the truth that is in Jesus. If we are believers, open our eyes, Lord, as we need our eyes open today. If we've not yet come to Jesus, open our eyes, Lord, to see the truth that is in Jesus, to see our need. Open our eyes, Lord, that our great, great need, which we cannot meet for ourselves, would be met in the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, in the name of God, who is sovereign over the whole world, over all people and over all languages, this morning in our service today, we are joined by our Mandarin-speaking church, by uh, Pastor Martin down here. And we have many today in our congregation and our choir who Mandarin is their language. So we're going to do this as we celebrate the Lord's resurrection. We're going to sing a song in both Chinese and in English. It sounds kind of crazy. So we're going to do it, okay? So in a moment, we're all going to stand. And then we're going to have our, our Mandarin cooking 
uh, folks today are going to sing verse 1 of our hymn, and then we'll sing that same verse again in English, and then we'll do verse 2 in Mandarin, and then we'll do verse 2 in English, and then here's the great part, on the third stanza we're all going to sing simultaneously, you'll see on the screen for that one, words in both Mandarin and English. Everybody got it? Let's all stand out together as we sing, crown him with many crowns.
Father on this day of all days. We are so grateful for the fact that you bore our sins to Calvary, but today we celebrate that you rose from the grave. And from because you did that, we can have salvation and we are reunited with you. We are so, so grateful. As we pass the offering plate, Father, we put in just a small token of our deep admiration and love for you. We ask that you use these gifts, these that you've asked us to bring to your house, to further the message of Jesus Christ around the world, so that all may know, so that all may know the joy of this day and why this day is so different from all other days. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
God. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, will be our focal passage for this morning, from which we will be speaking on the subject of, You Will See Him. This is part of a series of messages. The series title is Fulfilled, and today our subject is, You Will See Him. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Among the great riches that we have in this account are two meeting announcements. Two meeting announcements. One of them there in verse 7. The angel said to the women that they were to tell the disciples of the Lord Jesus to go to Galilee and there you will see him. And then again at the end of the passage, the Lord Jesus himself says, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Now, of course, in this passage, there is also a meeting. Uh, Jesus met these two women. And then there are these meeting announcements. There is this small meeting between Jesus and the two women. And then the announcement of a larger meeting that is to take place. You will see him. You will see him. These words echoed down through the generations with applicability, with relevance for us. He has been seen. And he is seen. And he will be seen. He has been seen. Let's think about that a bit. Notice here in verse 9. Behold, Jesus met them and said greetings, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Jesus met them. And then later in the chapter, we are told about this larger meeting with Jesus' brothers, with his disciples. And we hear there that they saw Jesus. He has been seen. Think of the significance of this. These two women, both of them named Mary, went to see the tomb. They went to see a tomb. A tomb in which Jesus had been laid, who had been crucified. Who was crucified. These two women knew that very well. They had been at the cross and they had seen Jesus as he was crucified. They had heard him cry out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then they heard him cry out again in loud voice. And then they saw him breathe his last. 
and yield up his spirit. They saw him dead on the cross. And then they also saw him laid in the tomb. They were there when he was laid in the tomb. And they knew that he was dead. They knew that he had been buried. There's no reason to make any mistakes about this. The Romans who were presiding over the execution, the Romans who administered the execution on the cross were highly skilled in what they did. They were experts at crucifixion. And really the honor of the Roman Empire uh, depended upon it. They knew how to inflict pain. They knew how to inflict suffering in crucifixion. And they knew how to ensure that the victim of crucifixion was dead. And Jesus was dead. They went to the tomb. And then he was seen. Then he was seen alive. He was seen alive by these two women. And he would be seen alive by his brothers. And who are the brothers? Well, back in Matthew chapter 12, verses 49 and 50, Jesus has looked around at his disciples, the large group of the disciples, many disciples. And he said, who is my mother and who is my brother? And then he said, those who know the will of God and do the will of God. These are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. There had been a good many disciples in addition to the 11 who had come to Jerusalem as Jesus made his way there for the Passover feast. They had been accompanying him. They were still in Jerusalem. And these women were told to go and tell his Brothers, The 11, yes, the 11 remaining disciples and the many disciples who were followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the time came for them to meet on the high mountain in Galilee, it was an appointed time. It was an appointed place. It's, of course, the place most likely in which what Paul referred to as the 500 brothers saw him at one time. The 11 were there. Yes, they were there. But he had already been seen by the 11 later in the day on which this, these events that we've read from Matthew chapter 28 took place. He had been seen a week from that day by them as well. He had already demonstrated to them fully that he was alive. And then to 500 brothers at one time, and the Bible tells us that over a period of 40 days, he was appearing to the apostles, demonstrating to them by many proofs that he indeed was alive. This is a remarkable thing. They went to see a tomb where a dead body had been laid. And then he was seen, seen by many witnesses. And this was God's design. This was God's plan for Jesus to be seen by witnesses, for his resurrection to be thoroughly confirmed so that they in turn could proclaim the fact of his resurrection. The Apostle Peter assures us of that specifically in the home of a man whose name was Cornelius. He said, God raised him on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It's not that he was prohibited from appearing. We're told that uh, we're told in uh, Acts chapter 23 and verse 11 that the Apostle Paul, who was in prison at the time, had a remarkable experience. The Lord came and stood by him and spoke words of encouragement to him. And it's not as if he can not make himself known in ways analogous to, not historically precisely the same as, but analogous to what took place in this passage, we're in the Muslim holy month, the Ramadan now, and there are many Muslims around the globe who are praying for visions and who are praying for dreams in which God will be speaking to them. 
And the fact is that a great number of people who have from a Muslim background turned to Jesus Christ in faith and been saved share that their uh, experience of salvation through Jesus Christ was connected somehow to a dream or a vision in which Christ made himself especially known. It's not that this kind of thing cannot happen. It's not that this kind of thing does not happen. It is that the basic design of God is that Christ would confirm thoroughly the fact of his resurrection to witnesses in the first century and they would proclaim him with great confidence and with great conviction and it would be made known. This was God's plan. He has been seen. This is crucial to our Christian faith. And then also, he is seen. He is seen. In fact, the scriptures exhort us, fix your eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and for the joy set before him, endure the cross, despising its shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fix your eyes upon Jesus. In the same book that has that exhortation in it, earlier said, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. That is, for all practically speaking and obviously and visibly, under his feet in subjection to him. We don't yet see that, but we see him. We see him who was made for a while a little lower than the angels and who suffered in order to accomplish redemption for people in sin who were in need of forgiveness, who were in need of cleansing, and now exalted exalted to the right hand of God. We see Him, and through the generations, many people have seen Him. In the same generation in which the apostles were preaching, it was experienced. People who had not seen Him with physical eyes, raised from the dead, came to see. They came to see Jesus about 50 days after uh, this uh, event took place in Matthew chapter 28. There was a great crowd of people gathered in the city of Jerusalem. And the apostle Peter and the other apostles were preaching to him. And as they were preaching about Jesus Christ, talking about his resurrection, talking about him being alive and the Savior of all who would call upon him, as they were doing this, about 3,000 of them, the Bible says, were cut to the heart. They were moved deeply. They were able to see, and they were able to see what this meant for them. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatian Christians, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1, it was before your very eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And, no doubt, as risen as well. The Apostle Paul was saying, in our preaching to as we were describing what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ for your salvation, it was publicly betrayed before you. It was as if, not the same as, but in a way analogous to, you being an eyewitness of what was taking place as God was working out salvation in Christ Jesus. To the Philippian Christians, the Apostle Paul extended greetings from all who were with him when he was in prison in the city of Rome. He said, all the saints greet you, get this, especially those of Caesar's household. Now, Tiberius had been Caesar on the day that, uh, emperor of, the, uh, of Rome, on the day that Jesus died. It's almost certain, almost absolute, not as certain as things could be, that Tiberius never would have heard the name of Jesus. Here this is 30 years later, and there are Christians living in the city of Rome all that way from Jerusalem. And there's apostles saying that those in Caesar's household who have come to faith in Jesus Christ extend you greetings. 
in the household of the emperor, there were people who had seen Jesus. And what marvelous effects seeing Jesus has upon people. Back in the year 249 in North Africa, there was what, there was what could be referred to as far as that vast region of North Africa. A pandemic is called the plague of Cyprian. And a remarkable thing happened during that plague as people were desperately ill with symptoms that were fearsome and were dying right and left in the cities and the villages. The non-Christians, the pagans, they fled for the hills. They got out of town. They left behind family members, members of their household who had been effect, infected with this sickness. Left them to fend for themselves. Left them to die. And Christians nursed and cared for their sick and the non-Christians among whom they were living who were sick. And Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage, said, These Christians, believing on Christ as they do, they face death as a departure into salvation to be in the presence of their Lord forever in the firm hope of the resurrection because they know that He has been raised. What marvelous effect seeing Jesus has on people. And so how is he seen? How is he seen now? Well, he's seen in the scriptures. He's seen in the testimony that the scriptures contain of his resurrection and of the meaning of his death and of his resurrection. And they're seen as God works inwardly to reveal the truth in the hearts of men and women. The resurrection of Jesus itself is a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture pass, uh, promises in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Notice these prophecies of the death of Jesus and then also the indicators that the death of Jesus was not the end of the story. He was cut off out of the land of the living. Cut off out of the land of the living. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. He poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many. But now, all this about his death, all of this about the grave, and still he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. How could this be? That he would die, albeit for these reasons, but that he would die, and then he would be placed in the grave, and then he would experience such victory as this. Well, these words of prophecy are here as well. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or to the grave or let your Holy One see corruption. Oh, has he seen? He's seen in the Old Testament scriptures that pointed to his birth and his ministry and his death, including the reason for his death as a substitute for sinners to pay the penalty for sin that we would have to pay if he had not paid it on our behalf and his resurrection as well and then in the new testament we hear the testimony of those who did in fact see him and knew that he was alive and were willing to endure great suffering and continue faithfully in their testimony of Jesus Christ, even at great cost to themselves. And the way the Bible says 
we see or the explanation for our seeing in relation to these things is right here. God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, the light of the knowledge of His glory in the face of Jesus Christ. That's how we are able to see. And if we want to see Jesus, well, what should we do? If we want to see Jesus, what should we do? The answers are remarkably simple. We should read our Bibles. And we should go to Sunday school. Or a Bible study. And hear the stories of the Bible. And we should come and hear preaching from the Scriptures. Where we know that Christ is preached from the Scriptures. Christ is exalted and presented in the preaching of the scriptures. Not to accept everything passively, to accept everything without discernment or without careful investigation. We ought to do all those things and hear what we hear in the way that the Bereans did. Acts chapter 17 and verses 11 and 12. They heard the testimony of Jesus Christ who died and who rose from the dead. And he was the Savior of all the world. And they went and they searched the Scriptures for themselves to see if these things were true. That's exactly what we ought to do. Manfred Gutsky was a brilliant man and a strong young man. He'd been a boxing champion in the Canadian Army. And in his youth, he was teaching in a prairie school, a plains school in uh, Canada. And he was an agnostic. He didn't know whether God existed or not. In fact, he did not think that human beings could know. And then he was profoundly influenced by a Christian farmer who moved in the community and very obviously took his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ profoundly seriously. He was deeply affected by that and he ended up praying a prayer. God, I don't even know if you exist. But if you exist, and Christ is who my new friend says he is, then I ask you to show me. If you are real, if Christ is real, I ask that you would show me. And over the coming weeks and months, his life was profoundly transformed. And he became a great witness of Jesus Christ, proclaiming Christ and helping so many other people see as well. He is seen. Perhaps he's being seen right now in hearts in this room. I'd be very surprised if he's not being seen right now in hearts in this room. And then he will be seen. Today, a brother Leo and a Harry, both of them, are confessing their faith, not only in this sanction, but this public testimony and a witness of baptism is to show to the Satan, to the angels, to our Lord, who is in reason. To tell the world that both of them are willing to follow Jesus, our Savior. It is not only their willingness, but the effect. The power of Holy Spirit that have chosen them as the children of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. In a moment, we will see their testimony and to hear their testimony one by one. And then we will baptize both brothers one by one. Just share with us with joy and to, to, to hear what they have shared in their own testimony. First is Harry, brother Harry. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the Lord for leading me to be baptized today as a member of Wana Street Baptist Church in the presence of our brothers and sisters in the catechumens. I would like to share two Bible verses first. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And God demonstrates His own love for us in this. 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before I came to know God, I was lost, not recognizing myself as a sinner and not knowing how to approach God. I previously waited for a moment that would make me feel that God exists, or that would allow me to see His guidance. I didn't realize until now how foolish I was in the past and how powerful God's wisdom and creation is. The power of God is really amazing, far beyond my imagination. Everything was arranged as early as when I was born. My grandfather, he is a Christian, evangelized for me from a young age. Although I was uninterested and my parents wanted to shield me from it, that has planted the gospel seeds in my heart. In college, I discovered a Christian group on campus, which reminded me of my grandfather and his stories. So I joined out of curiosity to learn more, not yet ready to be baptized. And after college, I attended an English-speaking church, but struggled with the language barrier. Despite attending weekly, I was confused about God, the Bible, my relationship with God, and more. Although I took catechism classes, I didn't feel ready for baptism. And I was applying for a PhD during the time, and after I got admitted to the University of Louisville, I surprisingly, I surprisingly found out that a friend I met over five years ago through a game I played regularly, and his name is Haha. He's also an alumnus and a member of Water Street Baptist Church. And through him, I met Zoe and Orion, and eventually came to this church. Everything that seems coincidental to me was actually God's plan, leading me step by step to his kingdom. I also grateful to Pastor Yigang, Haha, Zoe, Ryan, and other brothers and sisters in the church for sharing and helping me, leading me to study God's word, answering my questions, and for helping me to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart. I confess I'm a sinner, wander off like sheep, straight off on my own path. I'm so grateful that the loving and true God doesn't give up on me, that he knows how lost I am and how helpless I am and that he is willing to take me by the hand of the Father and lead me to know him, to know myself and the sins I've committed. Repent and return to the Lord. Die with him, be buried with him, and raised with him. To the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. I have great questions to ask Harry before his baptism. Do you believe that our God is sovereign and He is creator of all universe? Yes. Okay. Do you confess that you are a sinner? I do. Do you believe that Jesus is your Savior? Yes, I do. Are you willing to follow Jesus in the rest of your life? Yes, I am. Thank you. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we, as a church family, we witness your baptism. I hereby baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ.
，这位上帝就是圣经中所说的独一的真神，创造天地万物的神。我承认自己是罪人，渴望接受耶稣基督作为我的救主，洗净我的所有罪孽。过去我脾气不好，年轻时。不知道如何对待妻子以及儿女，动不动就发脾气，处理认为这才是彰显男人在家中的权威。现在我明白了，神所设立的婚姻与子女是我需要呵护的。过去我曾是一个唯物主义者，相信个人的努力和奋斗。年轻时候刚刚创业是非常顺利的，从一个技术工程师到一名厂长，我一直认为自己是非常聪明和努力的人。但通过对圣经的深入学习，现在我知道所有的聪明智慧都是来自于神的恩赐，而非我个人的努力。人没有什么可以自夸的。今天，我愿意。靠着耶稣基督厚厚的宝血洗净我的罪，顺服基督的命令，全心全意服侍神。我愿从此活在主里，求主也活在我里面，直到永永远远。阿门。Several questions I will ask Brother Liu, but in Chinese. Liu Xiu Bei, brother, do you believe that our God is the Creator of the universe? Yes. Do you believe that you are a s 我们奉父子圣灵的名，为刘锡奎弟兄施洗。
make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen.